Hello ladies and gents, this is Unbiased History, Diocletian's Treachery by the channel Dove Hetty. <sighs> Last video was just terrible. I think more terrible than any other video I've seen. After Pax Romana, obviously everything was going to hell. Everybody was just killing each other for gaining power. They didn't even care that they were getting invaded by every Germanic tribes and everybody else. And you know, everybody's gunning for Rome now since Rome's been you know, on top for such a long time. Uh, everybody's gunning for Rome. This is not the time to play treachery card. This is not the time to backstab people. <sighs> so everybody just some morons just coming and seize power. Could not you know keep power and another person comes. They, they take power. I thought that was it. I thought you know it was the end. It was the end of Rome. But no. Aurelian came. The best emperor Rome has ever seen. Better than Augustus, better than Trajan, hell, better than uh, Julius Caesar too. Because of what he did, just his impact. Because he literally brought back Rome. Otherwise, Rome was screwed right there. He was done. He literally saved Rome on, all by his himself. I thought there was nobody left like that, but damn. And I'm like, Rome is looking up. Uh, Rome has just more few years of dominance. Nope, nope. Those mother goddamn Praetorian guards kill him again, just like they killed most of the previous emperors. I know people say they have political power. I don't care how much political power you have. If you are emperor, you have more. I mean, look at the past emperors. Uh, emperors like Trajan and lots of other, like Nero. They, they were just, you know, uh, literally dictating things. They were doing what the, whatever the hell they wanted. Some of the emperors literally changed entire Praetorian guards, literally swapped them. So some of them definitely could have just disbanded them. Like, you know what, I've seen your past, all the things you do, I don't need Praetorian guards. You know what, I'll take chances by myself, I don't need guards. That's just, what, Senate I can understand, you, you can't just disband Senate and, you know, in front of people stand like, yeah, this was a good move. But Praetorian guards, those are not needed. And obviously they killed Aurelian. Yeah, it's just, it's just it's just last few episodes back, and it's all I think going down now. Then there is no coming back. It's done. It's definitely done. Oh wait a minute! It's not Diocletian treachery. <laughs> I read it wrong. It's Diocletian tetrarchy. Oh okay. <sighs> Let's see what happens in this episode. Damn, I had to edit that otherwise. Friends music, okay. Propos. <laughs> Those pussies always get me. The restorer of the world was betrayed after saying he even wore a mask what was all that about why was he wearing mask aurelian that was cool too in the empire from decades of civil war and barbarian invasions aurelian's death was mourned by all when the catastrophe was relayed to the legions they were consumed with the most anguished sorrow and direst anger all of aurelian's assassins were then rounded nice. up and subjected to the worst tortures known to man they then sent word nice. to rome Expressing that none of the officers felt worth Since this is apparently Skyrim and worst torture for uh, you know Praetorians are poison darts, I think that's wrong. I think they should have just left him with Nazim. Worthy enough to follow on Aurelian's steps. Depression and rage the only thing in their minds. The Senate, in turn, was horrified at the prospect of having to elect the next emperor, given who he would have to live up to. So they begged the legions to choose one for them, which they refused. They begged again, were refused again, and this sure, and that's happened. continued for months. And as it did, during the interregnum, Aurelian's wife... I'm sure that's what happened. Senate, like, you choose it. They're like, no, Senate, I respect you more, you choose it. I'm sure that happened, and not the other way around. Opia Severina ruled Rome, the first and only empress of the whole Roman Empire. Did I say that she had a daughter of Aurelian? Because she did. 
not that it will be relevant, I assure you. So what can we say about our little Augusta over here? Well, for starters, she wasn't a Severan. Forget the last name. Instead, she was related to Trajan's line, as the first name implies. She was a Romano Dacian survivor too, so if a woman ever deserved to rule Rome, Opia's as good as it gets. And what did Opia do with all of her power? Absolutely fuck all. Refusing to take advantage of her husband's death and just printing coins for fun while waiting for a successor to be chosen. So after 8 months of back and forth, the senate relented and decided to pull a Nerva and elect a highly capable old geezer as emperor, Marcus Tacitus, a full-blooded descendant of the good historian. Taken by surprise with the elevation, Tacitus gave a fine speech, granting the senators lots of power to appease their egos. Quite fitting, as he would be the last emperor they ever elected into power. Opia and her That's daughter grim. <laughs> Last emperor senate ever chooses. That's grim. What's gonna happen to senate now? Voluntarily abdicated and vanished from the history books. Tacitus then traveled to Moesia to meet- That's understandable. Uh, knowing what has happened in the past uh, so many years, how many people just died in months. Basically people come, stay emperor for 2-3 months and die because somebody stabbed them. So obviously they were, you know, fearing for their life, knowing that they, you know, uh, they are connected to, let's say, Roman monarchy. So they're like, you know, we are not part of Roman monarchy anymore. We are going away. We like to live. Meet to the legions. Saw that the legionnaires were still torturing Aurelian's assassins and decided to just ease tensions and order their executions. Meanwhile, word of Aurelian's death Screw reached him. the germs, who used this chance to remind everyone that the crisis of the third century was still ongoing. Tacitus then sent his half-brother and Praetorian prefect, Florianus, to go clean up the Danube from 99% of the germs. And to help him rule, Tacitus appointed the legate Probus as governor of the eastern provinces. For after a lifetime of war in the service of Aurelian, including retaking Egypt from Zenobia, Probus had become among the best generals of the time. While touring the east, Tacitus heard that the breach of the Lime Germanicus allowed the Germans to invade Gaul again. Alemanni, Franks, Goths, Vandals, Burgundians, every viral species. But before viral he could species. respond, he caught a very weird illness. It basically drove him mad, making him name all 12 months of the year in his life. What's with the Roman and keep getting sick suddenly nowadays? Was the sickness too high around that time? Honor, and then dying right after. Deja vu. And as the emperor's half-brother, and having the most legions at hand, Florianus usurped power and acclaimed himself emperor, Ugh. to the detriment of Gaul. But he Why are Roman people, you know, obviously, this, uh, every unbiased history videos are completely true, since it says right there it's unbiased history, I'm sure. And knowing that, why are Roman people even, you know, g g giving all these virgins even power to begin with? They should just elect Chad people like Aurelian Trajans and, you know, like that. Why are they giving power to these weaklings in the first place? Idiots are constantly just causing revolt and trying to become, you know, make themselves emperors. At the same time, they can't even defend small places here and there. He didn't really have the legions. In the hearts of every veteran, only those among Aurelian's officer corps deserved to wear the purple. And among those, Probus currently held the highest rank, so it was him they recognized as Augustus. Florianus didn't relent though, and marched east to face Probus, which proves to be his undoing. Probus's reputation was that of a veteran that won victories in every corner of the empire, and when he faced him in Cilicia, he used his experience to lock Florianus's bigger army at the hot climate of the Sicilian gates. With the legions being tortured by the harsh climate, they just killed the usurper Florianus, and joined up with Probus, like they wanted to. And after being recognized by the senate, Probus- Hmm, some idiot who doesn't know anything, another is a great military mind, who served under Aurelius. Hmm, what should we choose? Of course they're gonna, you know, stab him in the back. Yeah, this, you know, the, whatever the, you know, subtitle overhead said was right. It's not treason if you kill a, another traitor. Probus defended Moesia against another Gothic invasion, crushing them so hard that they begged for a peace treaty. He yeah, then marched yeah. to Gaul and began brutally slaughtering all Germanic invaders. As he fought, he pushed them back to the Rhine, recovering Again. the lost parts of the border and killing as many barbarians as possible. By the end of the campaign, he spared the world of 400,000 germs and was acclaimed both Germanicus and Gothicus Maximus. Another Germanicus. Sadly, the border regions of the Rhine had been severely depopulated by the constant barbarian onslaught. So Probus figured on settling some germs as civilians in the most affected areas, hoping they would integrate with the local populace. Meanwhile, Diocles was serving in Gaul as well, 
alongside his fellow officer, Galerius, and seeing him rising through the ranks, he was approached by a soothsayer that proclaimed Diocles would attain great power yeah. by slaying a boar. And prophecies. These assholes are also the reason why lots of, you know, backstabbing happens in the first place. Them and their uh, damn prophecies. Never lie. They are just severed. As a diligent soldier, Probus allowed no idleness among his troops. If there were no barbarians to kill, then there were swamps to drain and farms to tend to. He extended that philosophy to the Praetorian Guard, and to keep their treacherous tendencies in check, he nice. appointed a man he highly trusted, Carus, as his Praetorian Prefect. Probus then rolled on, continuing to defend against barbarians from Raetia to the Nile. I think whenever somebody wears that purple, they just become treacherous, doesn't matter how trustful they are. So I'm, I guess that guy's gonna stab him in the back in the end. I guess. Pressing revolts from Hispania to Britannia and ordering the ruins of the empire to be slowly rebuilt. And after celebrating a triumph, he sought to revive Aurelian's campaign against Rome's enemies, starting, as he did, against the Sassanids. And with the number of Rome's enemies already decreasing a lot, Probus expressed joy that perhaps one day Rome won't even need soldiers anymore, an expression the Praetorians heard loud and clear. Already pissed at being forced to perform civic duty for once, and with the prospect of a peaceful future making their jobs obsolete, the Praetorian Guard then had Probus murdered, even oh, though he was about to give them the campaign they wanted. It's been 6 minutes inside the video, and they are already killing another people. Soon. Very soon. They then acclaimed their prefect Carus as their emperor, yet another unwilling Augustus to add to the pile. And yeah, after having yeah, all he's unwilling. My ass is unwilling. I think he was behind everything. I knew it. As he's as soon as he wore purple, I'm like, that's it. With his assassins executed and being too old to rule effectively, Carus elevated both of his sons, Carinus and Numerian, as Caesars, despite the weakness of the latter and the butchery of the former. In his reign, he would appoint Diocles as his cavalry commander and consul to boot serving together with a competent soldier, Maximian, who was also a really dumb politician, later sending Constantius to govern Dalmatia, the homeland of Diocles. Picking up- Is he the Constantine, uh, Constantine the Great? Was he the one? Hmm. Where Probus left off, Carus marched east with Numerian to face off the Sassanids, while leaving the west at the hands of Carinus. And as he cleaned up phrase from some barbarian invaders in the Sassanid Empire, Shapur's banishment made some weaker demons take his place, and when Carus invaded, he was met with little resistance, allowing him to take all of Mesopotamia, sack Tassiphon, and cross the Tigris River. While in Rome, Carinus proved again that some apples can fall really fucking far from the tree. The minute he became emperor, he started punishing everyone he'd envied or didn't like, completely trashed the imperial palace and married and divorced nine different women, none of them his actual wife. Once Carus heard of his son's depravities, he declared his intent to substitute him with one of his best legates, Constantius Chlorus. Yet another one of our Aurelian's veterans. Having personally helped him crush the Palmarine Empire, Constantius was well known for both his talent and loyalty. Acclaimed as Persicus Maximus, Carus prepared to venture even further than even Trajan did, and it was then that he was struck by lightning and died. For a competent emperor to yeah. incur divine wrath. Since the start of this series, how many people have died because of lightning? God damn. I've confused a lot of people, but not Commander Diocles who assured this must have been part of some grander divine plan. Convinced this was a sign to return home, Diocles convinced Numerian, guided by his Praetorian prefect, to order them back to the empire. As they marched west, April told the legionnaires the emperor had suffered from an eye disease and had to be concealed from the light. So they kept on going, with April relaying ever more absurd orders in the emperor's name, while a foul stench arose, all making Diocles grow ever more suspicious. Breaking in to check on the Marian, he found the Emperor's corpse rotting in a pool of his own blood. Betrayed by the Praetorian Guard, who could have guessed? The Marian's generals then had April seized, meeting together in Nicomedia to discuss what to do next. And after realizing Carinus was now the sole Emperor, the generals agreed that the greatest among them, Diocles, should rise to confront him. The generals and legions then gathered on a hill outside Nicomedia and proclaimed Diocles as Augustus. He accepted, drawing his sword towards the sun, renaming himself as Gaius Aurelius Valerius Diocletianus and executing Aper for all to see. Aper, by the way, is Latin for boar. Doja. 
seeking to free the Empire from the tyranny of Carinus, Diocletian marched west, and Carinus in turn marched east. Just then another usurper rose up in Pannonia, and man what's with that fucking place and traitors? Well anyway. Before Carinus' overwhelming numbers faced off with Diocletian in Illyria, Constantius joined up with his brother in arms, helping him survive the initial battles. Carinus, however, enjoyed the opposite situation, and legion after legion refused to fight for him, defecting to Diocletian's banner. And as he raged on, he was suddenly backstabbed by his Praetorian prefect, one of the many officers he had cooked. Emerging victorious as the sole ruler of the empire, and then immediately crushing the last barbarian horde still raiding the empire, Diocletian concluded Aurelian's legacy, officially putting an end to the crisis of the 3rd century. That Damn. enemy peace was assured, far from it. In fact, Diocletian's unending obsession throughout his reign would be to ensure nothing like the crisis ever happened again. The decades of torment had shaped- But you can't blame him. That, without Aurelian, that crisis almost brought Rome down. That was it. Diocletian into a brilliant yet cynical mind. And after seeing how irrelevant and unhelpful the Senate was during it all, he grew to despise it even more than Domitian, ignoring it completely. The age of Augustus's Principate has ended. No longer would power be derived from the corrupted institutions of the Republic. Rome needed something more. Thus, the Emperor's authority now derived from nothing else than divine right. The age of the Dominate had dawned, with Diocletian not as your Princeps, your first citizen, but as Dominus, your lord and master. Damn. And to prevent the past from repeating itself, Diocletian concluded a single emperor could hardly rule effectively if the empire faced multiple threats at the same time. Diocletian knew only truly great men could rule over the whole Roman Empire. So to build a system where great men weren't needed, he chose to elevate his friend Maximian as Caesar, assuming the title of Jovius, another name for Jupiter. Alright, so I guess uh, Diocletian is first proper king of Rome. Without Senate. Senate is disbanded, I guess, now. Huh. And Maximian taking the title of Herculius, the son of Jupiter. With two emperors to help each other, and their authority now emanating from divine right, Diocletian severely discouraged future usurpers from rising up as they used to. And with his rule consolidating, Diocletian's attention shifted to the Praetorian Guard. Oh, the Praetorian Guard. He detested them with the fury of a thousand souls, but instead of killing them all, Diocletian felt more appropriate to humiliate them instead. All Praetorians were then kicked out of the Imperial Palace, cut down in both number and wealth, and sent to guard an irrelevant shithole of a fort in Rome, given no task but to see at how irrelevant they now were. Indeed, their treachery now only reached as far as the Milvian Bridge did, right beside the entrance to Rome. And for those of you who have kept this place in mind, keep keeping it. The discouragement, however, didn't include Barb- <sighs> Diocletian is officially my favorite Roman of them all. Fuck! Damn Praetorian Gods. And also Senate. And I, I don't like, you know, dictatorship, obviously. But I feel like after watching all this episode, all the things that everybody like, I'm the Caesar, I'm the, Caesar, I'm the king, I'm the emperor, I'm gonna lead. I feel like whatever he's doing right now is, is gonna bring some stability to Rome. And it needs it. It definitely needs it right now. Barbarians, forcing him to go crush some Sarmatians, and later sending Maximian to Milan, where he was to rule the West and hunt down some bandits raiding Central Gaul. Regarding the Sassanids, Diocletian had the weak demon king bow to his whim, making him return Armenia and give up more of Mesopotamia. And as he did, the Germans in the Rhine started naval expeditions of their own, ransacking the Gallic coast, all while the Alemanni and Burgundians redestroyed the Limes Germanicus. So to deal with the pirates, Maximian sent his best naval officer, Carausius, while he fought the germs on the land. Unfortunately, Carausius cared for nothing but gold. Not only taking the wealth the Franks stole for himself, but outright letting the germs pass by and sack entire towns, just so he could intercept them and take the raided wealth for himself. Horrified Another by his news, asshole. Maximian demanded Carausius should come back to him and answer for his crimes, which of course he refused, stealing the Imperial fleet for himself, using the wealth to bribe the Britons to support him, allying with the Franks, helping them take over the Gallic coast and proclaiming himself Augustus of his new Britannic Empire. A really dumb politician indeed. And no one was more pissed about this than Diocletian. The legitimacy of the diarchy at stake, Diocletian refused Carausius' demands to be legitimized, elevating Maximian as an Augustus to save his reputation, then coordinating with him to launch a counter-invasion, brutally ravaging Carausius' germ allies. Having helped him do so, Diocletian returned east again, got flanked by rude Sarmatians again, and crushed them again. 
Maximian then built his own fleet, completely botched the invasion and then blamed everything on the weather. Hearing the news, the Euclidean sighed and marched west. What's with Britain and its navies? Doesn't matter which time it is, doesn't matter under which, their, their navy is always strong, isn't it? Again, meeting with his co-emperor in Mediolanum, throwing a party to save Maximian's reputation and making sure to humiliate the Senate some more. But the diarchy wasn't working as it should. If one of the emperors needed help from the other, it left their part of the empire leaderless. And so, Diocletian doubled down his new system, transforming the diarchy into the tetrarchy, with the theme of four emperors, one empire. And he I think that's a mistake by his part. He should have just kept himself as one emperor and keep four more people under him. That would have been worked better. Four emperors just gonna stab each other in the back just to become emperor, I think. This is going to be power, you know, power grab for everybody. He should just keep himself as the true emperor and keep other four under him to work for him. That would have been more sense. That would have made more sense. He just had the right man in mind. His two veteran friends, Constantius and Galerius. The latter was then elevated as Caesar of the East by Diocletian, arranged to marry his daughter, and the former as Caesar of the West by Maximian, who had already divorced his wife and married Maximian's daughter. So here's Diocletian's tetrarchy, one empire, ruled by two senior Augusti, with two junior Caesars to serve as heirs and rule the shit provinces. Each had their own capital, borders didn't mean shit really, they pretty much just did whatever Diocletian told them to, and once the Augusti died, the Caesars would take over their place, and two new Caesars would be chosen. Do notice the senators completely powerless over here, where they belong. Since they were all one big family Okay, now, so he didn't officially disband the senators, they're still there, but they'll... They're like dead all right now. Diocletian hosted both of Constantius's and Maximian's sons in his court, among them an ambitious little cunt, Maxentius. He then sent Galerius to go crush a revolt in the Nile, and then Constantius to go put down Carausus' revolt. Being granted the hardest task in the empire, and seeing the part of Bononia was the main base of Carausus' fleet, Constantius first cleared the Gallic coast of the Franks, then laid siege to Bononia, making his legions build a dam over the port, denying it any relief, and forcing them to surrender. With his Britonic empire now crumbling, Everybody's playing Caesar, isn't it? Always just, you know, cutting their supplies off so they eventually surrender. Carausus was then murdered by his Praetorian prefect, Alactus. <laughs> nah, just kidding, he was his finance minister of all people, but who cares. Constantius ah, the Beautiful Fleet invaded- He almost pissed me off at the- I almost broke my mic there. ...and had Alactus killed as well. With their partners in crime now dead, the Franks were let off the leash and started slaughtering all innocent civilians around them. As they marched south to sack Londinium, Constantius halted them, completely exterminating every last Frank, and when he turned to start what was gonna be a brutal siege for Londinium, the local Brits received him as their hero, acclaiming him as the restorer of eternal light, Redditor Lucius Eterna. <laughs> the Redditor Constantius then returned to Truyer in the round. <laughs> I feel like they, they saw that, oh no, we are, we are gonna be dead, let's just praise him. <laughs> While his Augustus Maximian was fighting Frankish pirates that had gotten all the way to the media, germs in North Africa. Imagine that. And after dealing with some Berber barbarians in the mountains, we get to what most defined Diocletian's reign. Reforms, reforms and a fuckload of reforms. Starting off, not only did Diocletian more than double the number of imperial provinces, but his new system of dioceses would be stolen by the Christians of all people. The governor of each diocese not only now ruled over less resources, but the soldiers in his lands were now led by another dude, the Ducks. In fact, Diocletian made it so bureaucratic and military careers were permanently distinguished from each other. And speaking of the legions, Diocletian also got rid of the old cohort system as a whole. Basing much of his thinking from what emperors like Gallienus had to endure, the barbarian invasions were now too big for 5,000 man strong legions sparsely placed to deal with. So he did two things. One, he hugely increased the size of the army from 390,000 men to 580,000 men, most of them stationed in the east. The navy got a bump as well. And two, the Roman army now displayed two main units, the Limitani Ripensis, plebs that guarded the frontiers part-time, and the new legion, the Comitatensis, making up nimbler units of 1,000 men each and supported with a lot of cavalry. The legions were now far more mobile and practical, so much so Diocletian built some 20 new legions, and inspired by Aurelian's walls, every major city across the empire began Oh god, so during the crisis of 3rd century, yeah, that's what <laughs> Germans was not successful. That just gave Romans time to think like what to do, and Diocletian here just, you know, changed everything. 
just doubled his army, changed systems. Rome is even more dangerous now, damn. Began building walls of their own. In this new system, with the Limitani defending the borders, small invaders were easily repelled, and large invasions were both spotted and relayed to other troops. Once the big barbarian hordes broke through, they would be unable to break through the nearest city walls, lacking siege weapons and all. Getting harassed by local forces until the nearest emperor had time to muster the legions and kick the barbarians back to their mud huts. Defensing death, we now call it. A common strategy for large empires. And this was all terribly expensive as well. So to collect the taxes to pay for it all, Diocletian sent his agents to perform the first empire-wide census in history, cataloging every last property, land, plab and patrician there was, figuring out how much each citizen could provide. Sadly, the Denari by that point was utterly worthless, so Diocletian issued new coins, among them a new gold coin, the Solidus. THE gold coin, the one everyone and their peasant mother would copy for millennia. It was THE gold coin, the one the gold coin that became stereotypical of the Dark Age kingdom who copied the empire. Okay, so he's the first guy who ever brought up the gold coin. Damn, alright. Diocletian turned out to be more important than I thought. Everyone and their peasant mother would copy for millennia. It would take a while until the monetary reforms took effect, so Diocletian had his new army of bureaucrats to come up with an equivalence chart of items to temporarily replace currency. When the tax collectors came, the plebs were allowed to pay with anything – foods, goods, their mother, whatever they had. And part and parcel of Diocletian's enlightened autocracy, he standardized Rome's taxation system on all provinces, meaning that Italy, long exempt from taxes, now paid as much as Illyrian provincials and the like did. Only Rome remained safe from this, as despite of the Senate, Diocletian still respected the Eternal City. But as you likely gathered, he didn't care for plebs at all. In fact, in order to further stabilize the empire, Diocletian transformed the plebs into proto-peasants, serfs, if you will. They were now tied to their land, and get this, permanently changed to hereditary professions. The plebs were now to inherit their father's profession, and never be allowed to quit. God damn. That is the biggest dictatorship I've ever seen. That is so effed up though, man. Without Diocletian, Aurelian, uh, the Rome was hopeless. It was about to, you know, fall. Most people were about to get killed by Germanic tribes. These people came like, you know, Aurelian and Diocletian. They saved the Rome. But now they're, you know, sucking the life out of every single citizen there. <laughs> Both sides are effed up. What, what would they do, man? that the empire would never run short of crucial professions. While these reforms tackled pretty much all problems inherent of the 3rd century, inflation still ran rampant, and man, did that ever trigger Diocletian. Such inflation forced his own soldiers to blow their entire savings just to live another day, and every time he was reminded of this injustice, it enraged him deeply. And who did he blame? None other than the merchants. None of them Jewish though. Hadrian really didn't mess around. I mean, and yeah, he, he meddled with the coin. So obviously the next step left is merchants. Damn merchants. So to fight this injustice, Diocletian wrote a fucking huge book, listing every single item that could be sold in the empire and establishing a maximum price it could be sold for. But no one paid heed to it, even if the death penalty was at stake. Alas, the world just wasn't ready for the full force of Diocletian's reforming genius. And with, say, most of his reforms an astounding success, Diocletian then went to fight against some other Sarmatian. Yeah, lots of those like um, uh, maximum retail price and things like that are even continued today. Invasion. Again, this time in annihilating them so hard they pretty much stopped being an issue, calling himself Sarmaticus Maximus and building a series of forts to strengthen the Danube, with 15 legions worth of Limitani to guard it, which was much easier now without the Dacia sticking out into the Carpathian Mountains. Meanwhile, Galerius was finishing crushing some wee wizards down the Nile, then went to Syria to face the renewed Sassanid threat, none other than Shapur's own son, Narsei. Yes, the demon had laid eggs before his banishment, ensuring that his <laughs> demonic line would continue tormenting the world. And after usurping power from the weaker demons, Narsi sought to restore his father's reign of terror, invading Armenia and then the Empire, and say it with me, slaughtering everyone on his path. Galerius then went to stop him at Carhe, but was completely overwhelmed by his endless hordes of evil. Barely managing to return safely from the battle, he was met by one furious Diocletian. For having disgraced Rome, Diocletian made his junior Caesar march a mile on foot throughout the desert sun, 
and having punished him so, he granted him some reinforcements to invade for Armenia this time, cucking Narses cavalry in the mountains and beating him back. The Sassanids then camped away to recover, only to be caught by surprise. Damn, Diocletian's punishment works so good that he actually kicked their asses now. By Galerius, forcing the demon to flee in panic, letting his soldiers, wife, and harem of chaos to be captured alive by Galerius. The Romans then marched south and sacked Tassiphon for, uh, what, the sixth time now? I lost count. Diocletian and Galerius then got Narsi to agree meeting up and discuss terms of peace. And get this, the Sassanids started out by demanding the Romans to be magnanimous in victory. Which just made Diocletian explode in anger. It was only after beating all of Narses' minions to death with Valyrian skeleton that he was able to get his point across. The emperors then humiliated the Sassanids, retaking Armenia, expanding on Mesopotamia, and setting the Sassanid borders under permanent Roman occupation, ensuring peace for the next 30 years. And to thank for their efforts, Egypt threw a big revolt. It's simple really, with Diocletian now cracking hard on the ancient Egyptian tradition of tax evasion, they revolted under a dude whose name I won't even bother you with. After pacifying the countryside, Diocletian personally sieged Alexandria, for no Egypt didn't even attack, I thought Rome sacked Egypt for lots of goods man. <laughs> what more could you want? <laughs> 9 gruesome months. After finally breaching in, Diocletian vowed to go full Caracalla on Alexandria until the blood reached his horse's knees, which was when his horse laid down on the pool of blood. As a pious man, Diocletian took the hand, and was merciful instead, ending with the citizens of Alexandria erecting a statue in Diocletian's horse's honor. The two emperors then went to Antioch to attend a spiritual sacrifice, but as the priests carved into the animals' entrails to read the gods' words, they couldn't find anything. And when they were questioned what the problem was, he said that the Christians were fucking with his sacrifice. And yeah, they were. Furious at their impiety, and as Diocletian revived Decius's edict against Christians, he saw yet another foul cult arise. Manichaeism. Seeing it for the demonic Persian chaos cult it was, Diocletian ordered all Manichaeists to be persecuted, destroying their temples, burning their religious texts, and executing every last one of them. And you know what? It worked. Manichaeism never grew too big and it was eventually eradicated from the empire, which gave both emperors some ideas. To decide what they should do, both emperors went to visit the Oracle of Apollo, one of the purest aspects of Sol Invictus, Damn, but he was unable to help them, claiming that the impiety of the world had blinded him. For both emperors, enough was enough. For centuries the Christians shunned Rome's gods, defied its emperors, and set fire to everything else. They deserved nothing less than a great persecution. Oh, God. One, two, three, and go. Diocletian then wrote his edicts. By imperial decree, all churches, temples, texts, wealth, and rights were destroyed across the empire. But the Christians didn't comply. And as punishment, the Christians were fined, demoted, deposed, jailed, and exiled in the army and state. Now bitchier than ever, true to Christ's cook tradition, they complained, lied, disobeyed, profaned, revolted, and hid no matter the cost. Despite Diocletian's mercy, the Christians tore the edicts from the streets and set fire to the imperial palace. Twice. The Christians had broken the law, ancient Roman virtues, and by then, Diocletian's patience. All lawbreakers were executed, and emperors. As soon as I saw the red eye, I'm like, that's it, that is it. <laughs> what happened to the Jews are gonna happen to the Christians now. <laughs> ordered to kill, jail, flog, nail, cleave, flay, and torture every last Christian that disobeyed. Salt was rubbed in their wounds, forced to kneel to Rome's deities, and gouged, impaled, threatened, depraved, and injured in every way. Their leadership was devastated, and Diocletian made it law to kill, jail, flog, nail, cleave, hang, flay, torture, gouge, impale, threaten, depraved, bruise, stamp, injured, behead, mutilate, to destroy, whip, tear, strike, cut, savage. Wound, exile, sack, menace, and burn every single operating Christian. Thousands of Christians lie dead. Their <laughs> I half, you know, I half expect a do do to go with a cop like ah, that was a good time or something. <laughs> Man, anybody but Romans and do just have a field day whenever there's something like this. <laughs> Leadership gutted and churches destroyed, but in the end. It was too little, too late. The Christians continued proliferating, disobeying edicts, bribing off authorities, and overall negating all of the persecution's achievements. Diocletian and Galerius had killed many Christians, but at the end of the day, that's all they accomplished. Constantius had predicted the persecution's failure, so he never invested too heavily on it. Maximian did though, but he was nevertheless unsuccessful as well. 
to calm down. Maximian celebrated their 20 years of co-rule by bringing Diocletian for his first ever official visit to the Eternal City. And in his honor, Maximian ordered build and Diocletian finished building the Baths of Diocletian. Yet another massive bathing complex. It fit well with the massive palace he built back in Dalmatia too. More on that later. But try as he might to chill, Diocletian couldn't stop noticing how Rome had degenerated from the days of old. When he looked at the streets, all he saw were them filled with dirty plebs, adulterous whores, spreading Christ cookery, and corrupt Praetorians just looking for someone regal to stab. Enraged, Diocletian cut his visit short, refusing to attend his ninth consulship ceremony, already knowing the state the Senate would be in. He then returned east, helping Galerius to defend against a small Dacian invasion. But as he assisted him, Diocletian developed a crippling illness. He then returned to Nicomedia, opening a circus built in his honor and then secluding himself in his palace, growing ever weaker. When everyone grew to assume he had died, Diocletian reappeared, an unrecognizable shadow of his former self. Diocletian then gathered his men on the very same hill he was in two decades ago to proclaim He's suddenly old now with white hair, okay. in his resignation, the first emperor to do so. Having become too weak to rule, he vowed to step out so that the younger Caesars could take over, convincing Maximian to do the same, though he really didn't want to. Diocletian then elevated Galerius to the position of Augustus, as did Maximian to Constantius, and to fill up the two vacant Caesar slots, Maximinus and Constantius' sons were ignored. Maxentius was one of those little shits that could never be trusted with power, but it was Constantius' son that Diocletian was most concerned with. He was then left to Galerius to pick to the next Caesars, choosing an old military friend of his, Valerius Severus, yet another non-Severan, and also his own nephew, Daya. The Tetrarchy now, formally, looked like this, but really was more like this right now. Here's the new Caesars not quite yet in power, there's Maximian and Maxentius left out, and here is Diocletian, spending his retirement in his Dalmatian homeland, cultivating the noblest of all vegetables, cabbages. And in the west, Constantius ruled on, crushing even more germs on the Rhine and humiliating the Picts beyond the wall, setting a base in the Boracum, modern York, and getting acclaimed as Britannicus Maximus. But Constantius' time was also at an end. Nearing his death, he called upon his soldiers to gather around him and listen to his last wishes. And the words that Constantius then uttered would change Rome and the world forever. What? What? He's not gonna talk about the words? So I guess that was a Constantine the Great who uh, established Constantinople. <sighs> this episode was good, man, compared to the past episode. At least some good thing happened. Diocletian was really good emperor. Uh, in the end, I thought, well, you know, Rome is done with good emperors Aurelian, then Diocletian. These are good emperors, man. Diocletian did lots of things that also helped Rome a lot. And even today, people carry those things over. Next video is Constantine the Great. I guess we are going to witness the, you know, create some Constantinople. I think that's where, you know, the capital of Rome shifts to Constantinople. I love that part about Praetorians though. Screw Praetorians and screw the Senate. Uh, even though I hate dictatorship and lots of things Diocletian did was, I really hate that. But at this point, I thought that was the that was the needed thing to do since it was too unstable. Rome was too unstable. People were just killing each other, revolting just for taking power without thinking that enemies are at the gates. You know, Rome is about to you know screw over. This is not time to personal gain. But those damn you know virgins didn't realize that only chads were needed, and Diocletian and Aurelian was one of them. So yeah, this was a great video. I loved it. Alright people, if you like my reaction, don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time.